Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I am hitting the road again starting next month. I'll be speaking in Dallas, in Houston, in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Kansas City. All that's happening in the month of July. And then I'll be out in Dresden, New York, and Sarnia, Ontario, Canada, in the month of August. All the details on all of those events at my website, sethandrews.com slash events. Donald Lee Klein. He was a doctor of obstetrics and gynecology. He got his M.D. from Indiana University School of Medicine, and back in 1979, he opened his own infertility clinic, and he ran that clinic for 29 years. And during the first decade of those 29 years, Donald Klein secretly used his own sperm to sire more than 90 children through his unsuspecting patients. Now, remember, this was way back before DNA testing technology, back before ancestry tests. There was no doubt Donald Klein thought he was never going to be caught. In 2017, there was a woman named Heather Wook, and she was packing to go on vacation. And while she was filling up the suitcase, she got a notification on Facebook. There was a Facebook message from someone she did not know, a strange woman. A woman who claimed to be her half-sister. But Heather was an only child. She had no siblings. She almost deleted the message, you know, blew it off as spam or some kind of scam. But she noticed that that sender had mentioned a doctor's name, Dr. Donald Klein. Heather took this to her mother because her mother had gone to an infertility clinic run by a Dr. Klein so long ago. And Heather's mom said, don't worry about it. It's nothing. It's probably just a scam. Go on vacation. Enjoy yourself. But even while Heather was away, more and more Facebook messages started coming in from other people claiming to be Heather's half-sibling. Her phone broke partway into the vacation, so she was essentially disconnected off the grid for about 10 days. And when she finally got home, she logged back into Facebook, and there was message after message after message from people all across the country reaching out. These people had searched for potential relatives, and they had seen a link, a genetic link, to her Now, she had that account because she was interested in genealogy and her own family tree, and so her husband had gifted her an Ancestry.com account on a Christmas a while back, and she found out she was part Scottish and part Irish and part Scandinavian, but Heather never clicked on the link that showed whether or not anybody else on Ancestry.com was genetically related to her. She didn't go that far. But these strangers appearing in her inbox, they all said they were genetically connected to Heather. They were all sired by the same man, a doctor named Donald Klein. And it turned out to be true. Dr. Donald Klein had indeed sired all of them and many others So many of these cases revealed via Ancestry sites like Ancestry.com and 23andMe.com. 
etc. We can only imagine the feeling of violation and betrayal that these people felt and continue to feel. And Donald Klein was caught. I guess you could say he was caught. There's no law in Indiana or in most states in the U.S. for that matter. There's no law that specifically forbids a doctor from using his own sperm in his patients. So he couldn't be charged with that kind of crime. The best the authorities could do was to convict him of two counts of obstruction of justice. He lost his medical license. He paid a fine and did a year probation. He went to civil court and ended up on the hook for a pretty big sum of money. But his victims are justifiably angry that he, still alive, is not in prison. So, what did former Dr. Donald Klein have to say about all this? According to many of the people who went public, Donald Klein defended himself by invoking his faith. He was quoting verses like Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, whatever that's supposed to mean. There was a Netflix documentary about all this. It came out last year, titled Our Father. And it alleges that Donald Klein was actually motivated by his religious convictions, convictions linked to an extreme version of Christianity called Quiverful. Now, Quiverful is a male-dominated culture. And in this culture, women are pretty much the gears in a Christian reproduction and population machine. Large families are considered a blessing from God. So the more kids you have, the more blessings you get. Quiverful, right out of the Bible, Psalm chapter 127, verses 3 through 5. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offering a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And I find it interesting that the Bible verse says, blessed is the man, right? Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now, was it quiverful ideology that motivated Donald Klein to impregnate more than 90 unsuspecting women with his own seed? We can never know that for sure. We're not able to read his mind and know his motivations. Absolutely. Lots of speculation. But we can see his relationship with patriarchal cult thinking and a faith that it apparently fueled his desire to become a fertility doctor. And it's very possible that he was trying to play a key part in populating the world. I mean, if nothing else, this story provides an effective lead-in to the main subject we're talking about today, quiverful culture. And the whole world is talking about this again because Amazon has just released a docu-series called Shiny Happy People. And this focuses mostly on the Duggar family, the Institute in Basic Life Principles, the IBLP, and a guy, I would call him a cult leader named Bill Gothard. Now, I know you're likely familiar with the Duggars, but let me do my due diligence here. Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar, they were married way back in 1984. They were a big part of IBLP and Bill Gothard. They knew him personally and stood by his side. Bill Gothard really was kind of a proxy for God himself. He was, I mean, a cult leader. If you look at the way he stood on stage and commanded and dictated and told other people how they should think, how they should live, certainly how to have and handle their children. And this is ironic. Bill Gothard himself never was married. He never took a wife and he had zero children. On top of that, Bill Gothard himself would be accused of sexual harassment and sexual abuse by more than 40 women. Now, those cases were dismissed, and to this day, Gothard protests his innocence. He's still alive. He's 88 years old. The Duggar family has 19 children. They're probably most famous for the TV show that had 10 seasons on TLC, 19 Kids and Counting. 
And the Duggars and the hidden abuse and the cover-ups, especially the cover-ups regarding Josh, the oldest son, the guy who molested his sisters, and then the larger Bill Gothard cult and culture. These are the focus of the new Amazon docu-series. And a lot of people don't know too much about Quiverful. I mean, they maybe have seen it in their periphery. But they've been watching the documentary, and they're just shocked. They're shocked to see what IBLP really is and what it really does. There's a columnist at MSNBC. Her name is Sarah Posner. She's upset with Amazon for not going far enough. An entire angle was missed or largely ignored. The ties between Christian homeschooling curriculum and today's religious rights. And I have to agree with her. I think this is a missed opportunity. Quiverful and its cultural cousins. They're all about dominion of the world by population. More Christians means a more Christian world. In this larger Christian world, the men will continue to pretty much run everything. And of course, women will continue to submit to the authority of men. They will be trained pretty much to produce children and take care of the domestic stuff. And if you run into some of these women on the street, you might think you walked into an episode of The Handmaid's Tale. And of course, the whole thing, the culture, gender, role, submission, authoritarianism, especially with men at the top of the pyramid, this is all drilled into the minds of young children. I remember curiosity was just trained right out of us when I was a kid. We had one workbook, an ACE workbook, and the children look up with trusting eyes toward their mentor, teacher, and authority, Mr. True Word. And that was his name. Mr. True Word is going to give us truth. What kind of information is Mr. True Word teaching? You know who would qualify under this model? Ken Ham of the Creation Museum. Now, in the television show, 19 Kids and Counting, the Duggar family took a tour of the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Here's a clip. God created the heavens and the earth. And from that reasoning, you can, you can see how the earth was formed and with the flood and all of the things that science really backs up what scripture says. Do you ever wonder if your parents are censoring? Do you know what censoring means? Do you, do you ever wonder Taking parents, out. Yeah, do you, ever, do you ever wonder if your parents are trying to like not let you see the other side of things? I don't think my parents are trying to not let us see the rest of, you know, the world. I think the world is definitely, um, as the Bible says, 6,000 years old. It's pretty obvious once you start looking into it. But what really would be more, you know, factual. It's actually more scientifically proven than billions of years old. God had everything planned whenever <laughs> he created the world in six days. Now, Bill Gothard's program didn't officially forbid college, but they did send out these letters that discouraged them from going to college. There was a letter produced by IBLP mailed out to students called Hidden Dangers of Higher Education. And these letters said college is unwise, it's unnecessary. I pulled up one of those letters from the second paragraph, quote, Exalting our human intellect is how sin began in the world. Okay, let's say you're a kid in Quiverful or maybe even an adult, and you have toured the Creation Museum or you opened up an IBLP textbook or you read a scripture or heard a Gothard sermon and you thought, eh, I'm not sure this works. Or maybe you're just a human being, and you do stuff, and you test boundaries, and you make mistakes, and you live an imperfect life. Look out. This could result in your destruction. Here is uh, some audio. This is Faith Elizabeth Hunter. She goes by Liz. She was raised in Texas in a family that belonged to the IBLP. And she talks about the culture that she eventually escaped. 
The biggest idea I remember is that everything in life is determined by your dad and there's an umbrella of authority that your dad has. So there's God, your dad, and then you. So if you do anything that goes outside of your dad's instructions, then God will no longer protect you and you can be open to all sorts of danger. My dad told me if I ever speed, like if I ever drive down the road faster than I'm supposed to, then I'd be out from under the umbrella of protection and God would let me get in a car wreck and die because I was not obeying my dad because I was speeding and he did not want me to speed. So then for several years after I was got my driver's license, I was terrified anytime I noticed that I'd gone over the speed limit that I was gonna die and it was gonna be my fault because God was going to let me die. I got sick with like the flu or something and I remember I was getting cold medicine and my mom looked at me and she said, so you're sick, so you must have done something to get sick. You, God is punishing you because you've gone out from under the umbrella of protection and you've gotten, like, this is why you're sick, is you must have done something to be punished. And I was like racking my brain, trying to think of something I did to disobey my parents, to be out from under the umbrella of protection to get sick. And I couldn't think of it and I was really distraught. But of course I was sick, so I wasn't thinking that properly. But that was always a warning that whenever you got sick or were physically injured of any way that their first thought was you must have done something and God let this happen to you because you disobeyed. That clip was first aired on uh, Lad TV back in 2022. Now here's a guy that is related to the Gothard culture. He's mentioned in the documentary Shiny Happy People. He is an independent Baptist preacher from Tennessee, Michael Pearl. And Michael Pearl runs a nonprofit called No Greater Joy Ministries. He's probably best known for his book, Train Up a Child. This is targeted to Christian homes, and it's really popular in fundamentalist, quiverful type homeschool environments. And this book instructs parents on how to use things like quarter inch plastic tubing to whip children in order to, quote, break their will. Michael Pearl also suggests other methods like withholding food, spraying your kids down with a cold garden hose, etc. In his words, quote, even mice and rats can be trained to respond to stimuli. His book has been blamed for the deaths of three children in different homeschooling environments. One child was whipped for hours until she died. The only time they paused the beating was to pray. There was another child suffocated after the parents cocooned him in a blanket. A third died of hypothermia and malnutrition. Her body was found in her own backyard. The parents in each of these three cases were tried and convicted. In each of these cases in the homes was the book from Michael Pearl on how to raise and discipline a child. Michael Pearl said it wasn't his fault. Here is a clip from Michael Pearl being interviewed years ago on the Anderson Cooper show. Mr. Pearl, though, sometimes in reading yourself, it sounds like you're talking about raising an animal, though. Like, like, the, like the, the ideas are the same. Do you view it as the same? The, the rules, the principles, techniques for training an animal and a human are the same. Give you an example. Wait, wait, let me just stop that. So you believe raising a, a dog or a horse, same principles apply to raising yes, a child? Yes, the first principle in training an animal is establish a relationship of trust so that the animal knows you're not going to hurt it. The same thing is true with a child. You establish a relationship of trust. The let second me, me, one is to communicate your will clearly. Now, just in case you didn't think Michael Pearl was awful enough, he's got advice for women because, of course, he is a man appointed by God to instruct Women. This is from a church service years ago as he speaks to wives about their angry husbands. If your husband is an angry man, make love. Get rid of his frustration. Make him happy. In another on-camera sit-down with his wife, Michael Pearl talks to wives about how it's not just about keeping the husband happy. They need to do what wives do for the sake of the kids. Uh, husbands uh, need their wives, and wives need their husbands, mm -hmm. and, and kids need mother and daddy to need each other. Yeah. So yes, there needs to be a balance, and uh, somehow, lady, you need to find a way to meet all of your husband's needs and do it cheerfully. Yeah. Because there's nothing more destructive to your children than them detecting an underlying tension. 
uh, like when he says, watch the video and we're going to spend time together and you say no and you show resistance. There's so many women that would give anything to have a man to love and cherish them. And he's trying to love and cherish you. And in this, we hear a lot of loaded language that can be used to excuse abusers, right, and subjugate the abused. You need to submit, especially sexually, because it's all part of closeness and intimacy, which means you are connected better to your spouse, and this is going to be good for the kids. You don't want to cheat your kids, do you? That kind of thing. Okay, enough of me talking about quiverful from the outside in. I'm going to talk to people who can speak to this from the inside out. I've got some very compelling conversations with ex-quiverful women coming up next. My patrons get this show early and commercial free. You are so appreciated. Patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. This is a broadcast which we are doing in the shadow of the new Amazon docu-series about the quiverful movement, Bill Gothard, the IBLP, and an entire culture of restriction and indoctrination and abuse, quiverful, that I wanted to include on this show some people who can speak to this from the inside out. I want to speak to Anne. She actually hails out of Ontario, Canada, which is interesting because when we think about the Gothard cult, we usually think the United States. But this stuff was well north of the border, and I wanted to uh, spend a few minutes getting her experience. Hi, Anne. Thanks for coming. Hi. Thanks for inviting me. Were you an IBLP kid? So it was IBLP. It was Bill Gothard material that we used pretty much the whole time that I was homeschooled. Yeah. I don't want to trespass on, I don't want this to sound like a, you know, gotcha question, but (laughs) was your mom qualified in any way to be a teacher? No, (laughs) neither of my parents. So um, their education was Bible school after high school. Um, Actually, I don't think my dad even has high school diploma, but he had Bible school training. And he became a preacher. Is that right? Yep. Yep. His whole life. (laughs) What was that church like? So we moved around a lot. Like we, until they joined IBLP, then they stayed in that church actually until he retired. But it was a very small Baptist church in Northern Ontario, small community, remote. There was no accountability from the leadership of the Baptist church. Like that they were in South Ontario hours and hours away. So my dad basically could control everything in the church. He was the final authority since he was the pastor and the church was very small <laughs> and actually just got smaller and smaller. It was not good teaching. And I think some people saw it and they would just leave the church. So we did everything for the church, like <laughs> from the sound system to Sunday school to we just ruled it. <laughs> so you as a child were also probably drafted into being a church worker. You got to go move oh, the yeah. chairs and help cook the fellowship meals and you got to do, 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 right? Yep. Everything. Not allowed to skip services. You're the pastor's kid. You get treated differently even in town because it's a small town. Everybody knows who we were. Plus, you know, we look different. <laughs> what do you mean looked different? <laughs> so with Gothard, it has very strict rules on modesty for women and they don't call them rules and they call them convictions, but they convince you that it's your personal convictions to be modest. So this is a bit of an interesting dynamic here with my family. We didn't always, we weren't always with Gothard. So I, I was uh, 13 when we joined, I think, or 14. And so I remember the before and we went to public school and then we got into Gothard and just went more and more down that hill to hopelessness. <laughs> now, did you um, eagerly go? This is a time when you are starting to blossom into womanhood. Puberty's kicking in. The hormones are going. Yeah. Did you embrace this? Like, wow. Wow, it's IBLP, conservative Christianity. Was that your mindset? Um, I actually, to join ATI, if you have older kids the age I was, we had to write a letter of agreeing to join. That was part of the application process. But as a 14-year-old, you want to please your parents. And if you don't agree, then what kind of headache and problem is that going to give your parents? So you have to agree. (laughs) Like It's not... So then for a long time, when I left it, I felt like 
I couldn't blame anyone but me because I had agreed to join it. <laughs> you were a kid. Um, you were a kid. I know. Now, yeah. I, I need to make a clarification, forgive the interruption, but you've mentioned IBLP and ATI. Uh, they are related. Yes. They're often uh, one in the Those same are... advanced training institute, correct? Yes. So okay. that is the specific homeschool curriculum and program was called Advanced Training Institute. IBLP Institute in Basic Life Principle was the umbrella that all these other organizations were under. So all their seminars and all that were under the IBLP umbrella. Was there any science in your science books? Was there any history in your history books? What? So, <laughs> what? Last year was the very first book, and I'm 40, was the very first book I ever read on evolution. <laughs> all I ever knew about evolution is how bad and evil it is, and all I ever learned was the counter arguments to science. <laughs> Um, yeah. Forgive my silence. I, it's not because I'm shocked. It's because you and I have a lot in common. You and I have yes, a I lot in common. Reading your books, I know. <laughs> and then you think, wow, who sheltered all this information from me? And then you realize it wasn't the information that was sheltered. It was me, right? Yeah. yeah. Were you threatened by evolution? Yeah, very much threatened by evolution when we first got, when I first married my husband, you know, married young, courtship, all of this, but he did not grow up with Bill Gothard influence as much. I mean, all churches have some Gothard influence, um, but not under the umbrella of that. Um, he was struggling with the whole idea of evolution and creation and kind of landed in like creation, but in an evolution way. And we would fight like we <laughs> we are we get along super well but we would argue about this whole evolution slash creation thing and I would just I would get so angry I'd have to walk away we could not talk about it for years <laughs> in our marriage because I was like how can you not believe in literal 24 day seven day creation like that's the foundation of your entire faith of the bible and if you don't believe this then are you even a christian <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever tour yes. the Creation Museum? Was that ever a thing for you? No, I did not tour okay. it. Um, the fact that we live so far away up in northern Canada did not lend to those things quite as well. I have heard but Canada have... has a Creation Museum somewhere. I don't know. If I... Oh, does it? <laughs> I'm sorry. We we had all the Canham videos, though. We watched all those videos, uh, all the books. My dad had books he would sell at church, you know, all the Kenham. <laughs> so, without knowing what evolution was, I knew all the arguments against it. Yeah, we didn't know what it was, but we just knew it was wrong. And then oh, we, yes, we were very. trained to make fun of it. Were you under yeah. your, I know you were under your dad's authority. Did he rule with an iron fist or some other instruments of discipline? Yeah, it was very tough living under my dad. Um, I would say he's a narcissist or tendencies. Uh, there was no way to please him ever, no matter what we did. As I got older, he would change his mind all the time. ATI also doesn't really believe in mental health issues. It's just a matter of trusting in God. And I think there likely was some health, mental health issues there. So every day and even throughout the day, he was always trying to figure out what mood is in to know how to react or how to tiptoe around. Um, <laughs> like even our courtship, you know, I really, I bought into all the ATI stuff uh, the more I got immersed in it and bought into the courtship thing and tried to do the courtship with my dad, but he would give us permission for my husband and I to date and then he would take it away. <laughs> he gave his permission for him to propose and then he interrupted the proposal and took his permission away. He, like, and then he gave his permission again, but then he tried to break us up before the wedding. And it was, that's one easy way to explain it, but it was like that with every issue. If my mom and I went on a trip, there was no cell phones back then, but my mom would call from a rest stop and we had made our plans, but then the plans would be changed, even though my dad wasn't with us. <laughs> he just enjoyed There's, jerking you around. I mean, he just enjoyed the uh, total control. I think so. It must have been something like that because it it was excruciating. Like I wanted to please him. I truly 
thought I needed to please him. The whole umbrella of protection teaches us girls that we're under our dad, no matter how old we are. And I had an intense fear of stepping out of his authority because then it would be my fault when I would get raped. <laughs> and I'm not joking. That is taught. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> for, for context, and you determine the boundaries here. Yeah. He would set in place certain rules, perhaps even not related to sexuality. But if you broke that rule, then the, the penalty against you might be sexual violence. Am I understanding exactly. that? Yep. <laughs> uh, Gother teaches if you step out of the umbrella of protection, which is my father, then Satan will attack. And one of those ways that he can do that is sexual abuse. Yeah. Did you submit to your husband under God? I said I did. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here comes the first seeds of rebellion against God. So. <laughs> I'm not sure where the little spark inside, but it was always there. And it only came out after like 15 years of marriage fully. But I think our marriage all along was more equals <laughs> than, but I never would have said that. <laughs> no, I, but I, that's exciting to me because even then, <laughs> your value system, the temperature of the relationship was not one where it wasn't an arranged marriage, was it? Did you two fall in love? No, I wouldn't go as far as that because being taught so much about purity culture okay. and even about emotional purity, so really closed my emotions off to not having crushes on anyone um the i remember having a crush on someone and going to my dad to confess it and his as a young teen as a teen and his reaction i was like i am never doing this again ever so i i did marry my husband and we matched spiritually and all those things i would not say i had a crush on him <laughs> mm. um it was not hard to wait until marriage for any sexual activity because I shut down that part of me. <laughs> I'm walking carefully here. I mean, this is very I, personal material, yeah. but I also know that you, I'm pretty open. You want to tell your story in the hopes of helping other people and educating the public at large. Have you seen the Amazon documentary? Absolutely. I have seen it. I waited to watch it with my husband and we paused it to talk a lot through it. It was pretty tough. <laughs> Yeah. How close process. were they? Did they get it right? No. Yeah. But not even it. It's the tip of the iceberg, I would say. <laughs> but they definitely did a very good job to, to give a really good glimpse of what it is and what it was. Yeah. It was like a home movie in some ways. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure if I wanted to watch it because I'm like, I've lived it. Why would I watch it? Well, but. sure. I mean, we're potentially <laughs> ripping open the scabs of old wounds. I mean, I, yes. I get that. Yeah. But it's got to feel I validating think. to see the white hot light of scrutiny on this culture. You know? Yes. It is so nice to see it getting some exposure and really wide exposure and hearing it, you know, following the hashtags on Instagram and Facebook and adding my voice to those as well to... Yeah, that validation is so good, really good. And even I, I sent the link to my therapist and I was like, you might want to watch this. <laughs> and she says, I planned on it. I thought you would bring it up. <laughs> so you've got so someone, think, you've got a therapist, someone that you are speaking to who is part of your journey through yes. and out. I mean, I don't know. I, I know it's, there's not like an end zone. I am now totally no. recovered. It's a process, right? I'm not sure that anyone who grows up with Bill Gothard can ever be recovered. <laughs> it just goes so deep and different things will come up at different stages of life because they, they had teachings for all stages of life. So, the, so I can feel healed and that I've processed everything. And then the next stage comes up. <laughs> uh, for example, do I keep having kids? They really teach the quiverful, you know, that you have all, you leave, if you truly trust God, you will let him decide your family size. 
and then um, yeah, like homeschooling or sending to public school, like you just have these inner voices that comes through at all these life stages. So I don't know that we can ever be healed of it, but we can make progress. And last year I found a therapist that is religious trauma informed. And that was extremely helpful. I tried some therapists before, but if you have to start explaining the umbrella of protection and Bill Gothard and authority as a grown daughter under her father and courtship <laughs> it's just a lot like <laughs> yeah. well it's nice if someone can speak specifically to religious trauma this is another potential yes. trespass i'm going to ask it you do not have to answer did you uh struggle with or have you had the conversation with your own kids you no longer hold to any of it you are a changed person yeah, it's been tough. My oldest is 15, and I left the church, faith, all of it, three years ago. Um, I went from full-time missionary to agnostic in three months. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, I have five kids. I had been homeschooling for seven years, and <laughs> it was, it's been an interesting ongoing conversation with the kids because – I can't just, I couldn't just rip the floor off from underneath them and all I taught them and our whole family, family system and values. And even for myself, even though that it was a very drastic change, it still took a lot of time to process it and figure out what the heck was going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I recently, just in the last couple of months, I've had a talk with my 15 year old about all of this and he you know the older two remember a lot more so they still believe in God and I've had to have really just talks about them that you know they can I don't know I I'm leaving space for them and usually I'm not telling them what to believe or not to believe I'm no longer inputting anything in their lives or bringing them to church or and got rid of all the Christian books and things like that but we bring up questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'm always surprised, like they have a good head on their shoulders and they can, they'll be okay. <laughs> they'll be okay. Yeah. And now they're in public school too, which is helpful. <laughs> I like the uh, phrasing of that. You know, you've given them space, space to breathe. You're not ramming your position down their throats, but you're in encouraging and inviting curiosity and it's okay yeah. if you doubt, you know, there's, so much utility yeah. in that. This sounds so contrived. And when I say that, I think you are just so brave. I, you know, to, <laughs> a lot of people don't understand, especially I think lifelong non-believers or those who haven't come out of fundy faiths and cultures. They don't know. Like, I don't think they understand. You are. It feels like you're ripping out your own heart. You are betraying yeah. your own identity. And to yeah. not hit a wall and retreat and turn back or just shut down and stay there and go no further, but to actually continue to peel yeah. back the layers takes a tremendous amount of wherewithal and will and courage. And yeah. I'm just blown away by you. I think your journey is inspiring to me. And I would love, I would love for you and I just to sit down over dinner and be yeah. like, ah, we got to talk. We got to talk. We yeah. let's share some stories, you know, and we can it would encourage take each other. Many hours. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts on uh, Gothard, on IBLP, on homeschooling, quiverful, et cetera? It's definitely, I'm very glad that there's some spotlight to it. And I hope this conversation, the conversations will keep going and that people in all evangelical churches can realize that the Gothard influence is not just this cult out there. The influence came at just the right time in history. If you read um, Kristen's book, Jesus and John Wayne, like the Gothard influence just came at the right time that it's filtered to all these, all evangelical churches in, I would say, North America, not just the US, it's in Canada. <laughs> um, and people attended the seminars and took those teachings back with them. And there's just enough amount of the Christian truth, quote unquote, in all those teachings that it makes it easier to absorb and accept the fundamentalism. So I, I think, I hope people can look inward and really realize what, even if they've never heard the word Gothard, there's influence in their church and in their environment. 
and to be able to find that and reflect on those beliefs and decisions and where does it come from and is it really true and just ask questions. Oh, I can see why you were a problem earlier. Yeah. <laughs> he started to stir I have found my voice in yeah. the last three years. Oh, yeah. I can see that. Um, you little I have had church people talk to me Troublemaker. <laughs> troublemaker, Anne. Oh, yeah. By the way, it sounds like you need to row, run over and change a battery in the smoke detector, which yes. I, I've got a few. And the problem with my house, this is a total digression, is when I hear that little battery beep, I can never find which one needs the battery. So I'm always going from room to room and sticking my ear right on it. And then when I find it, it blows the side of my head off, you know, with this like 130 decibels. Anyway, I'm sorry. We Anne. have five kids and there's so much work to do with five kids. It's ridiculous. Yeah, thanks yeah. to Bill Gothard's teaching. So that fire alarm is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, somebody will take care of the smoke someday. It's okay. <laughs> and you are amazing. And I think a wonderful and necessary part of this show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Coming up next, I've got two people actively working and writing and counseling those who have come out of a quiverful environment because they came out of one themselves. I've got Janice Selby from the Divorcing Religion podcast, and I also have Jerusha Laughlin, who writes the Heresy in the Heartland blog. We'll talk to them next. Continuing a look behind the curtain with Quiverful, etc., and two special guests joining me now, Janice Selby. She is host of the Divorcing Religion podcast. She is also a registered professional counselor, does a lot of work helping people who have suffered religious trauma because she has walked those steps herself. And then Jerusha Kohler Laughland, who runs a blog, Heresy in the Heartland, Jerusha and Janice, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Jerusha, that's in the Bible, is that right? Yeah, yeah, kind of tucked away in the, you know, the genealogies. She was a queen. Yeah, I thought I knew my Bible, but I'm like, Jerusha? Well, Where? Where do I find that? Well enough. How many times did you read the genealogies? <laughs> no, it's I skipped chronicle. over them. <laughs> <laughs> Son of, daughter of. <laughs> of the lineage of, and there's Jerusha. Yeah. You are one of yeah. how many kids, Jerusha? I'm the oldest of 11. Ages ranging from? Uh, we were 22 years apart. So yeah, I'm wow. 47. And the youngest just turned 25, I think. Tell me about that. Obviously, it was a quiverful <laughs> thing. Was mom straight up at home, thing. like barefoot in the kitchen? I mean, does that stereotype prove yeah, true for much. her? I mean, she wore sandals, but yeah, we all spent a lot of time in the kitchen, as you can imagine with that many mouths. But I kind of think of my childhood as being broken up into segments. There was when we first began homeschooling, I was pulled out of public school and my parents started homeschooling in the early 80s. And there were five of us kids. And then we joined Bill Gothard's homeschool group later in the 80s. And mom and dad had six more kids. And I helped raise them, spent my teens changing an awful lot of diapers, thousands. Did you feel like helping to raise the other kids as a child robbed you of part of your childhood? I do. I don't really feel like I had a mother in the, that sense from the time I was 11 or 12. Because she was busy helping, you know, she had her own babies to raise. And by the time I was 13 or so, I was helping raise the babies myself. Jerusha, you said there was uh, something that caused your parents to yank you out of public school. Was it something specific? I'm not sure there was one particular thing. I think it was a multitude of factors. But they had attended their first basic seminar with Bill Gothard in 1980, right before I started kindergarten. And... They weren't ever comfortable, completely comfortable with public school because of their strong evangelical beliefs. And I think as they got more into Gothard and James Dobson, there were other, you know, many other influences, but Bill Gothard was a strong one in their choices about parenting. So we dreaded them going to another seminar because every time they came back, they had some new idea of ways that our family was supposed to be different and we would lose some privilege. They would you know, take away some of our toys or we couldn't wear 
I couldn't wear shorts anymore. Couldn't wear pajama pants because girls must wear dresses. So girls could wear nightgowns and boys could wear pajama pants. Uh, our music got changed. The TV, they threw that in the trash. We went for all the modesty rules and we got rid of all the rock music, which we didn't have secular music. So that was Christian contemporary music for us. You know, we had to give up. Steve Green couldn't live, listen to Household of Faith anymore because Jesus. <laughs> You had to get rid of your contemporary know, right? Christian albums. Like for those who don't know Steve Green, as I recall, Steve Green, he was like Mr. Mellow. Uh-huh. He's kind of the John Denver of Christian right? music. And we couldn't even have that. We couldn't have Sandy Patty. We couldn't have, yeah, it was, Bill went very extreme. Any form of the rock beat, which meant if the beat didn't hit on one and three, it was a backbeat and it was, demonic and we were opening our souls to Satan. This was a common teaching during the satanic panic of the 1980s. Yeah. There was... Uh, and before that, I think the anti-communist scares all brought in, they were anti-rock music too. Okay. So it went way back, but Gothard really pushed it. What we had been taught was that a certain kind of drum beat emulated the devil worshiping or you know, some sort of a witchery going on in African cultures. And it was, you know, the beat itself could infuse your life with evil. Janice Selby, I've had you on hold for a few. You weren't one of 11 kids, were you? Oh, dear me. No, <laughs> just one of uh, one of four, the youngest of four. And then I had two. And then immediately after my second was born, my then husband and I moved to a very conservative Bible college in Canada on the prairies, actually called Prairie Bible College. And while we were there, that's when I began getting exposed to extreme fundamentalist ideas. Otherwise, I had just grown up kind of run of the mill, crazy Pentecostal. But uh, once we really got into the kind of anti feminist, like Mary Pride, movement and then was exposed to the teachings of uh, the Pearl family. And of course, then eventually Gothard stuff made its way into our home. Um, My ex-husband was not a huge fan, but I thought the more rules, the better. Rules made me feel safe. And so I just uh, made things fairly unpleasant, I think, for my daughters. And actually, when we were watching this show the other night, I was texting in our family chat and just apologizing yet again for allowing myself to get hijacked by that fundamentalist movement. And I'm glad we all made it out. In the previous conversation Mm -hmm. I had on this show, we talked about the reality that this goes far beyond the quiverful cults. And you talked about the anti-feminist stuff. Pat Robertson, right, the 700 Club bigot, and evangelist recently passed away and it was brought to light some of the terrible stuff he has said like you know atheists were responsible for mass shootings and he blamed gay people for the attacks of 9-11 and he wrote about feminist he said feminism is a socialist anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands kill their children practice witchcraft destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. So both of you were warned about feminism. Is that right? Uh, feminism Some bad. Some of those equ- things don't sound too bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> but back when you were reading Mary Pride, they probably did. Who's Mary oh, Pride? Oh, she oh, was she uh, an author. Mom. Yeah. yeah, and sh- her book greatly influenced my mother. The ideal of the homemaker, homeschooling, submissive wife. She was kind of Phyllis Schlafly on crack. She was kind of a... um, um, Yeah, she was the homeschool version of Phyllis, I think. So I'm picturing floor-length jean skirts, the collar up to your neck. (laughs) Did you have the little handmaid's hat on? I mean, what? We didn't, but yeah, it was was pretty similar to what you described. I did. A lot of denim jumpers. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of our friends did the head covering, but we weren't quite that submissive, I guess. I've seen the pictures of you, Janice. I mean, you are straight up Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, I think that's exactly the vibe that I and my group were going for, really based on fantasy. Not, you know, the whole idea being you can raise perfect offspring, but nobody's perfect. 
children certainly aren't perfect. Adults aren't perfect. It just places a huge amount of undue pressure on everybody. It's horrible. Didn't you resent not having an equal voice? I mean, either one of you, Janice or Jerusha, in your private space when nobody's looking. Didn't she get pissed off? I did. I think I had a, a feminist streak going all the way back to reading Little Women and identifying with Joe March and thinking if I knew what I would do if I was a boy, I would I would grow up and be a preacher or a, a politician or all of these things that weren't available to me because I was a girl. And so I was bound to be a homemaker and Therefore, I didn't need to learn all the academics that a man might need if he needed to hold a job. And I know in homeschooling, it's a common problem for girls to be held back academically because they're not being prepared for the same thing that their brothers are. What I've heard in some circles is boys don't like you if you're too smart, but you were primed to be homemaker only. You hold the power of influence because God might speak to you and then you can tell your husband what you think he's saying, but you don't get to make the final decisions. I was lucky that even though I followed all of the courtship rules and, you know, my father was a part of my choice of a husband and all that, I ended up with a man that did not want to be my ruler or my head. But that worked out for me. Yeah, I'm so happy for you, Jerusha. And and my situation is like I came at it from the opposite angle because uh, I did have a degree of liberty in the home that I grew up in. We had TV, I went to public school, I could wear pants, all these things. But once I got hooked into the fundamentalist aspect, I was going to be a way better Christian than my parents. And I resented Mm -hmm. my mother for not teaching me more of the domestic arts. And I was sure that I could have a marriage that didn't have the same problems as my parents' marriage because I was going to do it the biblical way. And I put all the rules and pressure on myself. And my husband at the time, he said, you're making your circle smaller and smaller. How small are you willing to make that circle? Pretty freaking small. I just cut out things left, right, and center and felt very righteous in doing so. Interesting phrase. The domestic arts uh, yeah. makes scrubbing the floor and doing the dishes sound almost like uh, some sort of a creative expression. The artist, you are the artist of the home kind of thing. I was the domestic engineer. The documentary <laughs> Shiny Happy People, they talk about corporal punishment, spanking, beating, breaking the will. The word was encouragement. You don't spank your kids, you encourage them. Either of you have any experience with this, spare the rod, spoil the child mentality? Sadly. Yeah, and it predated Gothard, but yeah. We sat through sermons as kids in churches all over town where we listened to a man, always a man, giving detailed instructions on how we were, how our parents were supposed to beat us. And so we didn't question that God gave them the authority to do that. We felt it was cruel and often unfair and Uh, We resented them for it, but it was a part of daily life. And if it wasn't us, it was our younger siblings, and we listened to it many times a day. Yeah, my parents didn't spank us very often. Unfortunately, when fundamentalism got a hold of me, I became much stricter than they were. And there was a Christian book going around at the time authored by this woman, Lisa Welchel. She had played the character of Blair Mm -hmm. on The Facts of Life. And I used that book so often, I cut out all her little ideas, and I was sure to follow through on them. And I remember my my precious little three or four-year-old daughter, so innocent and sweet, and she said something that wasn't accurate. uh, And I told her that she was lying, and her punishment was to get um, hot sauce on her tongue. And that is still just, I just hate that I did that, that I was under the influence to be unkind and abusive in that way to my children. Did you have a conversation with your child after the fact? You know, all these years later, this happened. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, Both of them. Both of them. And in fact... (laughs) My youngest one eventually got tired of it when she was about 17. You know, after I 
gave one more apology and she said, okay, mom, yes, I forgive you. I know that you weren't in your right mind and you don't ever have to bring it up again. Mm. I forgive you. And that was so kind and beautiful of her. I heard someone else in a conversation who was going through a, a series of, you know, the, the party that had wronged them was so penitent and so traumatized by what they'd done. And at one point after the 20th apology, they looked him in the eye and say, you know, it's time to let that shit go. Yes. Oh, amen. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you just have to let that shit go. Did you worship Bill Gothard? Was he like God? I know he's God's proxy, but as the authoritarian, if he'd have walked in the room, would it have been like seeing Jesus? I felt as a kid that my parents did idolize him. But in my teens, when I got more and more brainwashed and indoctrinated in the system, and I I began to call him instead of Bill Gothard. And why are we using this Bill Gothard homeschool program? Because I really looked down on the materials at first. Um, but eventually I, I succumbed and I began to more reverentially refer to him as Mr. Gothard. And I later got to work at his headquarters. And so I did encounter him from time to time in person. And I'm afraid I didn't find him as worthy of reference as, you know, in person. He's a pretty unassuming figure. I didn't ever find myself wanting to worship the ground he walked on or anything. With the abuse allegations against him, the sexual harassment and abuse allegations, when those came forward, I'm not asking you to accuse him, but did they, did they, did that stuff ring true? Oh, we were very glad to see it come out publicly because these stories had been circulating privately as the former ATI student community grew online and then we began to meet in person and the stories began to circulate rather quickly of the things we'd seen where Gothard's private behavior and the behavior of others in the organization didn't line up with the public principles he touted and taught. So it was really good to see that make its way into the public awareness. It's like when the spotlight finally hit Jerry Falwell Jr., right? He's out there chest thumping Jesus yeah. and purity from the stage. And then all of a sudden you realize he's part of these sexual trysts and threesomes or whatever it was. And he was a total hypocrite, drunk on power, using his office to essentially access other people via sex. Janice Selby, anything on this one? Yeah, I, I just think that religious fundamentalism breeds narcissism and breeds predatory behavior because women and children are taught that their place is to be quiet and to obey and always to obey the oldest male or the husband or the father. So, yeah, that the phrase drunk on power absolutely hits home. I wondered for Jerusha, I know I interviewed you on the Divorce and Religion podcast. I can't remember. Do you still talk to your parents? I do not. We've been estranged for some years now. Did they see, and again, you can answer or not, their failure, your failure? I think they found that they had been too strict, that they had raised us with a vindictive, judgmental God, and they wished, as their idea of God shifted, they wished they had raised us with a gentler version of God, but they don't really seem to grasp the degree of harm that they caused. Jerusha, were there boundary violations? Did they force their, or try to force their way into your life to bring you back into the fold? We weren't raised with boundaries pretty much at all. So when I began to assert boundaries in my relationship with them, it was difficult for my mother to um, abide by those. And sure. She says, I brought you into this world. I am your mother. Yeah. And, and I, you know, she probably did mean well, and she meant well back then too. She was trying to keep us out of hell and purge the foolishness out of our hearts. But did you have a difficult time giving yourself permission to draw the boundary line as an adult? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It took years of trial and error and practice and practicing with other relationships outside the family, learning what good boundaries looked like and differentiating because you know, I wasn't allowed to have a normal adolescence. So I had never properly differentiated from my family of origin. And I got to do that in my 30s. So that was fun. Let me stay with you for just one more minute here. You've got all these siblings out there. Are you the only one yeah. who busted out? 
Are you it or have no, there been no, others? We all, we all did. We all did in one way or another. One, I believe, is still Christian. Out of 11. Out of 11. <laughs> is it 11 yeah. total so or the, you have 11 siblings? There were 11 of us. Okay. One passed away two years ago, but I'm sorry. there are 10 of us now. Okay. You're saying that the vast, vast, vast majority of the yes. children got out? Yes, we soundly rejected the way we were treated so harshly um, and being told that that was God's will for us. Janice Selby of the Divorcing Religion podcast. As a registered professional counselor, you've been part of the journey out. Tell me about that. You hear the stories. Many of the people who are ex-quiverful or maybe still navigating their way out, they find you. They open the lines. Tell me about that. Lately, I've been hearing from uh, several people in the religious trauma recovery community because of this uh, show exposing what's gone on in the Duggard family and, and Bill Gothard and so forth. And so sometimes I hear from people who are still Christians and in fact, they're really having a hard time because they don't want to give up their literal interpretation of the Bible, but they see that things in their church are not correct. So though it's really, really difficult sometimes uh, working with some of those clients. Many or most of my clients have left Christianity altogether, and they are trying to piece together their new identity, their secular identity, while still dealing with religious parents. Uh, it can be a really rough go. And most of the folks that come to see me do have issues around codependency and boundaries, just as Jerusha was saying. They were raised that they aren't allowed. That's right. Not allowed to. Uh, at codependency is really baked into Christianity. And so is the idea of, uh, you know, worshiping your captor. <laughs> and and that just puts people in a very challenging um, situation because you're supposed to love this this deity freely, but you also are in tremendous fear of them. So there can be disassociation going on, and that's what we find also when people grow up in uh, abusive homes a lot of times. And we share the same laundry list. There's adult children of alcoholics, and they have a list of issues that are particular to them. Adult children of religious nuts, or acorns as I call them, share the same laundry list. We have a lot in common yeah. because our parents were addicted to religion. It's funny that when I tell devout believers that the Christian model for love is an abuse model, they just blink at me, you know, because my God is a God of love. Jesus loved the little children, etc., etc., but when you see how Yahweh Jesus set the model up, right, if something happens to you, if you are harmed, if you make me mad and I harm you, it's your fault, you are not worthy, don't ever leave me or you will be punished, this is an abuser. This is domestic abuse writ large. This is fundamental Christianity. Yes, we're absolutely trained to be victims and predators can smell out victims a mile away. When I'm being really honest, I tell people Jesus is my abusive ex. You have written a blog, Jerusha, called Heresy in the Heartland. Part of your process, I'll call it, is sharing your story. What's the blog? Is it just a, a chronicle? I began writing because I needed to put into writing my new thoughts on my past, my past beliefs, the way I'd been raised, and it was a way of getting my trauma out while also changing my mind and identifying my new values. Isn't it funny how right. writing it all down, it just seems to help. Yes, I had to wash the, you know, the cult gets into your brain and you have to wash it out and writing seemed to do that for me. I'm going to link that blog in the description box. Janice, are there resources where I can point people? I know there were many even non-quiverful who have come out of fundy faiths or high control abusive cultures and they are on the edge of their chairs going, where can I go and who can I talk to? Who would you recommend? 
Jerusha actually spoke at the conference on religious trauma last year in 2022. She was part of a homeschool panel that we put together. Uh, and she had some really interesting things to say. So the conference on religious trauma takes place online every year. This year I'm hosting it in October. And people can go to my YouTube channel, Conference on Religious Trauma. I have been putting old sessions on there, as well as all of my podcast episodes go on there. I always tell people one of the first things they should do is to uh, read Dr. Marlene Winnell's book, Leaving the Fold. It's a very helpful book uh, when we are coming out of fundamentalist groups, any kind of fundamentalist religions, really. And then there are support groups out there. I also love recovering from religion. They offer a lot of great things as well. So those are kind of the main ones. And of course, they can come to divorcing-religion.com. That's my website. Jerusha Laughlin, you got any final thoughts? Well, I'm thrilled that this documentary, Shiny Happy People, is out there because it's very validating to see our experiences put out to a national audience. And it's it's something to be able to show our kids and our friends who aren't familiar with this. This is what we lived through. This is how we got to where we are. And when I reflect on the 20 years that I've been out of IBLP, it is possible to build a whole new life, to reframe your values and Choose the life you want. Jerusha Laughlin, who writes Heresy in the Heartland, which I will link in the description box, and Janice Selby of the Divorcing Religion podcast. I am reaching through the internet and hugging you both. Just a big Oklahoma bear hug from this Oklahoma heathen. And I am so thankful for both of you. And I'm delighted that you've escaped and are helping other people. It's, that's just huge. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Seth. It was great to connect with you again, Jerusha, as well. Same. Now, I want to address something quickly before I hit the final piece of the show, and that is this. We've talked a lot about misogyny and patriarchy and male control, and that's certainly a huge part of fundamentalist Christianity, etc. But it's also true that many men are themselves victims they grow up controlled and broken. They are spoon-fed or force-fed horrible ideas about the world and wrestle with those ideas and those doctrines and those teachings. Their own innate goodness sometimes struggles with the stuff that they are taught. They don't want superiority. They want equality. They genuinely want to try to discover the world, and yet they're beaten down and broken and told to sit down and shut up. And this is true for a great many males in Quiverful. And alongside many women who have come out and exposed the culture, we are also seeing some men do the same. I had a listener named Clay send me an email, and he gave me permission to share this short story about his own experience. He said, my ex-wife and I raised five children together. She homeschooled all five kids. We didn't follow Gothard, but my wife was a fan of Michael Pearl's ideology, and my wife and daughters loved to watch the Duggars TV show. For a long time, I believed that I was a good Christian father. My quiver was full. But in the early 2000s, my faith was starting to erode. I was a young earth creationist and a Liberty University graduate, but early cracks were forming in my worldview for a variety of reasons. Around 2005 or 2006, my oldest son, who we raised in the faith, declared he no longer believed and considered himself an atheist. My world was shaken. I was very concerned for his soul, and I began to look for logical and scientific answers that might win his faith back. While I did find content that I thought was compelling, I also experienced frequent bouts of cognitive dissonance thanks to solid arguments about the age of the earth and evolutionary science. I looked for biblical support to answer the growing doubts in my mind but I finally started to see the contradictions and fallacies in the Bible which further shook my faith. I kept my growing doubts a secret from my wife, but it was definitely taking a toll on my marriage. 
My wife was bipolar and had anger issues, and the thought of being alone with her after the kids had all left the nest made me depressed. I was coming to the conclusion that life was too short, and the promise of heaven was losing its appeal. I separated from my wife, and we eventually divorced. In early 2014, the spell was finally broken, and I declared that I no longer believed in the God of the Bible. I remarried in 2016, but two years prior, I apologized to my oldest son for having to grow up in religious indoctrination, and I thanked him for being the catalyst that helped me to break the delusion. He was my best man when I remarried in 2016. Clay, thanks so much for sharing your story and providing an example, yet another example, that rescue is possible. Thank you so much for listening to this very important discussion about escaping fundamentalism. Be safe, be well. I will see you back here next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.